Welcome to the Versus History Podcast with your hosts, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, Connell Smith, and Elliot Watson. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Versus History Podcast. We're back again for another episode. And today we are joined by a very, very special guest. His name is Bernd von Koska, and he is the author of very captivating book on the Cold War with a particular focus on Germany. And it's entitled Capital of Spies, Intelligence Agencies in Berlin during the Cold War. Bernd, thank you so much for joining us. We're delighted that you've been able to make it today to talk to us all about this very gripping work on the Cold War. How are you today? Well, Patrick, thank you for inviting me and I'm fine. Thanks. Great to hear. Tell us all about you and your background and how you came to write this book, Capital of Spies. Well, I'm born in Germany in a, in a town that's called Trier. And then I studied history and, and, and law and political science in Trier and also in Stafford. That's Kiel University now, I guess. It is. And that was when the wall came down. So I experienced the coming down of the Berlin Wall in, as the only person in front of a TV in the living room in a, in a huge student's home in Stafford. In the West Midlands <laughs> so, in England. Well, that's, yeah. a, that's a strange place to experience it. <laughs> that's right. So uh, then I became a curator of the Allied Museum. I was one of the founders and curators in 1994. And since then, I'm at the Allied Museum. I was for two years the acting director of the Allied Museum. And while I'm doing that, a lot of subjects dealing with espionage came across uh, the line. And I did a couple of exhibitions on, uh, for example, the Berlin spy tunnel, on the military missions in East Germany and stuff like this. And then all of a sudden, a publisher approached me in person and said, uh, don't you want to write a book about espionage in Berlin? And I said, yes and no. No, because I'm not an expert on East Berlin, so I cannot do the second half of the book. But yes, I can obviously do the first half of the book, which is dealing with the Allied espionage activities in 1945 to 1994. And then he said, well, that's no problem. We'll find a guy for the second, for the East German part. And indeed, he found a very good one that is a Berlin journalist. He's writing for the national newspaper Die Welt in Germany, and he did more than 20 books, and he's very experienced, and he's an expert on national socialism and also on on the GDR and the Stasi. So we did this uh, book together, and it was quite uh, successful, and in Germany it's, it's the fourth edition now, and after, I would say, after two years, we had first request from Hungarian. They want to translate it into Hungarian. Uh, yeah, okay, that, that was fine. So we presented the book on the, on the well-known book fair in Budapest. Uh, that was an interesting experience. <laughs> and a couple of years later, there was another request to translate it into Swedish. That was also fine. And after, after we covered uh, the world languages, Hungarian and Swedish, I found that this book uh, should be uh, available in English. Uh, so it took me uh, a couple of months, actually uh, nearly two years, to find a publisher and to translate the book. And since two months now, it's on the market also in Great Britain and in America. Thank you, Bern. OK, please set the scene for us, if you will. What's your new book, Capital of Spies, all about? And why did you decide to write it? Well, it is about allied activities of intelligence services. Uh, going back um, until the early 40s, uh, let's say uh, maybe... The Berlin airlift and the Berlin blockade in 1948-1949 uh, might be familiar with some of you when Berlin was blockaded by the Soviet side and was completely supplied uh, via the air by American and uh, British uh, Air Force. And that was the time uh, when the Air Forces decided that uh, every 20, 25th uh, airplane is not a plane that is carrying goods to Germany, but that's a reconnaissance plane. 
So uh, they starting uh, this air reconnaissance uh, as early as that, and they continued it until the German unification. So uh, the area over East Berlin uh, is very well documented by <laughs> aerial reconnaissance of uh, British and Americans. And as I said, I did a, a couple of exhibitions dealing with the Berlin Spy Tunnel, uh, dealing with the military liaison missions um, that were uh, traveling uh, East Germany and had the permission to do that. That was they had a license to spy. And it's, it's a very interesting subject. And, and uh, 10 or 12 years ago, when we uh, did the book, a couple of those stories uh, could have been uh, uh, read for the first time. Uh, nowadays, of course, uh, a lot of uh, other books are on the market. Uh, for example, the Berlin uh, Spy Tunnel. Uh, you can read uh, the 20, 25 pages in our book that gives you a good overview. And uh, but also you can have the latest book of, 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 of Steve Vogel two years ago, who did uh, 500 pages on the same subject. So I think uh, uh, my co-authors, Ben Felix Kellov and I, we wanted to give a good overview of the activities of the Allies and the Stasi in Berlin uh, um, for the ones who just want to get started with the subject. Whoever's interested then in a, in a special operation can easily go into a bookshop and, and buy a book exclusively on the special operations. But we wanted to give an overview on those activities uh, over 45 years in Berlin. Thank you. Answers that one very, very nicely. OK, then the big question. Let's get the elephant out of the room. Why was Berlin so pivotal to the Cold War in the first place? How did the conflict impact on the city. Over to you, Ben. Well, Berlin was so unique because only here in Berlin, uh, the two main protagonists of the Cold War, uh, the Western powers uh, with America's, with Americans leading it and the Soviet Union with the GDR in the background, were, were living literally door to door in Berlin. They were neighbors in Berlin. And only things could happen in Berlin that could happen nowhere else in the world. There's just one single spot elsewhere in the world, and that is Vienna. And you have the, exactly the same situation in Vienna from the time period 1945 to 1955. But then in 1955, the occupation by the four allied uh, occupying forces, American, uh, Soviets, British, and French, ended in Vienna but it continued in Berlin. And that's the reason why Berlin is such a unique place for the Cold War, because only here you have this melting pot and this, 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 uh, this hot uh, area, this hot space of all those intelligence services that were running around and trying to gain information. And indeed, uh, the Cold War in Berlin was was unique. And uh, just a couple of months ago, I was uh, in, in Paris, I was invited to the, the Sorbonne University to give a lecture there. And uh, the lecture was dealing with the uh, artifacts, uh, objects of the Cold War in Berlin. And I presented a couple of them. Actually, I had a catalog with 100, 100 artifacts of Cold War in Berlin. And after lecture, I asked the students in Paris, uh, well, uh, can you name me one or two artifacts from Paris that came into your mind when you think of the Cold War in Paris. And they were thinking hard for about, let's say, 10, 15 minutes there. They couldn't find one. Uh, and the same same in Glasgow. I'm in a, in a project in Glasgow materializing uh, the Cold War. And, and again, uh, if, if the lecturer there is presenting the same question to the students in Glasgow, again, uh, they have to think very hard before they could even find one or two artifacts that would fit in that category. But in Berlin, it's actually uh, the land of milk and honey uh, if you're dealing with the Cold War. So every corner, nearly every building, every street, everything is somehow related to the Cold War. And obviously that uh, in the first step that ended in 1994, when the Allied troops, as well as the Russians, left uh, Berlin, the unified Berlin that was unified in 1990. 
But uh, still, uh, you have uh, traces of this Cold War in Berlin, and that makes uh, the Cold War subject uh, so attractive, especially for young people. And when they come to Berlin, uh, they obviously want to see the places. They want to uh, see uh, the Stasi prison in Hohenschönhausen. They want to see where the Berlin Wall was standing at Potsdamer Platz. And uh, they want to see the listening station at the Teufelsberg. And uh, we, we still have a lot of places you can visit and you can still feel uh, Cold War history. Thank you. Okay, then. Please tell us about the Stasi, if you will, Bernd. Were they really as bad as Cold War legend? would have us believe uh being as bad uh, you always have to compare it with someone or with something else Absolutely. uh so they, they did not uh have uh kill squadrons uh, uh traveling around the country uh, killing opponents but uh, they indeed imprisoned a lot of political uh opponents especially in the early years in the 50s And of course, in the 50s, a lot of people died uh, being imprisoned and sent to Moscow. And there was a book published, um, the title is uh, Shot in Moscow. And that's uh, what happened to a lot of uh, prisoners in the 50s that were sent to Moscow and shot there. But later on, uh, imprisonment is still still a very bad thing. As you can see nowadays, uh, if you have to imprison your political opponents, uh, you are not a democracy, obviously not. So, um, and there's one thing uh, they were pretty good at, and that is uh, trying to control their own people. Uh, keeping in mind that nowadays in China, you have obviously a camera uh, in every street and, and uh, the state knows exactly what you're doing on your mobile and your computer at home. But uh, looking at the 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, you just don't have this uh, um, possibilities as a state. You couldn't do that. Yeah. So uh, the system uh, in East Germany was that you were hiring a lot of people or blackmailing a lot of people just to get you information about other people. And uh, that was, uh, for me, the most uh, shocking thing uh, when people from uh, East Germany and East Berlin discovered after unification and after they had access to the Stasi archive, they discovered that uh, work colleagues and even members of their own family were writing reports on those individuals and sending them to the Stasi. And uh, that obviously is a uh, personal, a bad, a bad thing. And, uh, but that is a thing the Stasi was pretty good at. So finding out what their own people are thinking. Thank you, Bern. Okay, the Berlin spy tunnel then. Could you tell us more? Because I, for one, hadn't heard of it despite having taught the cold war for many many years and then the berlin airlift and then the berlin crisis 58 to 61 and then the fall of the berlin wall tell me more the berlin spy tunnel is really uh, uh, one of the top-notch fascinating stories uh, in berlin and and it has all you know if if john le carré would have written a book uh, on the spy tunnel He would have said, well, uh, that's a nice piece of fiction. <laughs> But it was no fiction in Berlin. It was reality. So the Americans and British had the idea, as I said, because here in Berlin, things were possible that were no one else possible. They had the idea to build a tunnel, to dig a tunnel from West Berlin to East Berlin and to tap the telephone lines in East Berlin. And uh, indeed, uh, they, uh, it took them a couple of months uh, to find the right place. Uh, they bought the area and they erected uh, a so-called radar station uh, right at the border from West Berlin to East Berlin. And they said totally legally uh, they would monitor the traffic in on the East German uh, airport in Schönefeld, which was legal for the Allies to do that. But the illegal thing was that from 
the cellar of this radar station, they were digging a tunnel and more than 400 meters long from West Berlin to East Berlin. And the end of the tunnel, they matched three major telephone lines carrying to the more than 280 single uh, telephone uh, uh, numbers. And those were very important numbers. Uh, they checked in, uh, they checked that before. And those were very important numbers that uh, the Soviet military in East Germany was using. So that's a nice story so far, but uh, the twist in that story came when after a couple of years, uh, it was obvious that the tunnel operation uh, was not a secret at all because a double agent, a British double agent called George Blake who was involved in this operation told the KGB right from the beginning. So even before they were digging the tunnel, the KGB knew about the tunnel. And then at the museum, uh, we had an interview with the leading officer of George uh, Blake, General Konradchov. And now he said the KGB had the problem to decide what to do with this information. Uh, should we stop the project? and risk our new top spy, George Blake, in uh, the British uh, administration? Or should we just you know, let it go and protect our top spy? And uh, the second thing is what they decided. They let the tunnel go, uh, they let it done, uh, and they protect their top spy, George Blake, in the British administration. And uh, that again led to a lot of confusion because later on uh, it was said that false information went through the tunnel but that was not the case. Uh, but finally, after 11 months, uh, the Soviets, uh, it was actually Nikita Khrushchev himself who said, discover the tunnel when I am on a state visit to Great Britain. We have a, a, a crisis with the British, and that is the Suez crisis in 1956. And he said to his men, discover the tunnel when I'm doing the negotiations in London. And that's how it was done. Uh, the tunnel was discovered um, when uh, Khrushchev was in London and uh, the British and the Americans had no idea uh, that this was all, this, that the discovery of the tunnel and that the knowledge of the tunnel, uh, that the British and Americans, they were just, just amazed when they discovered that George Plake was a spy for the Soviet side and they discovered that nearly uh, six or seven years later. So uh, looking backwards, uh, this story has everything. It has a spy, uh, you know, uh, it has uh, a cover operation, which was not secret because the other side knew from the very beginning and it all happened in Berlin and uh, a lot of more fascinating things around the tunnel uh, in the book. So, as I said, this is uh, the top story uh, of Berlin espionage. It's the Berlin spy tunnel. To what extent were ordinary Berliners aware of all the espionage and spying going on around them during the Cold War? Did it impact on their lives to any extent? And was it mainly the stuff of myth and legend that had little impact on the cut and thrust of daily life and routine in the city? Difficult one to answer because it's sort of based on a social history perspective, but it's always good to know what was going on on the ground with people who weren't, you know, high up in politics and rulers or leaders. So for the ordinary Berliners, what was it like living through the Cold War? Did they know about the spying going on around them? Well, in the early years, and that is for me the 50s, uh, the Berliners were well aware uh, what happened in their city. And I can just quote uh, George Blake. Uh, I mentioned him just uh, a minute ago uh, as, as a spy for the Soviet side. But he was sent to Berlin as a British spy. <laughs> And uh, after uh, he was imprisoned and, and uh, managed to uh, escape to Russia, he wrote his memoirs. And in his memoirs, he, he said, in the 50s, you got the impression that at least every second Berliner is working for some kind of intelligence agency, several of them for more than one. <laughs> so George Blake himself uh, 
and the people he uh, had to do had the impression uh, that the Berliners are actually using uh, this situation, knowing that there were so many agencies in Berlin looking for bits and pieces of information they could get, uh, that the Berliners were actually earning money uh, with handing out information. Even, this information was in many cases uh, not even accurate or even false information, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they get paid for it. And in the 50s, as I said, George Blake said uh, that uh, in his eyes, it is every second uh, Berliner who has something to do with some kind of intelligence agency and uh, making some money uh, by handing over information. Later on, uh, that changed, uh, especially because uh, of the erection of the Berlin Wall. So the Berlin Wall that was built in 1961 was indeed a physical barrier uh, to prevent uh, people and also agents going from east to west and, and back and forth. So that ended, that, that's over. So, and that made it of course uh, much more difficult And I think uh, that's the game changer there. And uh, the situation was totally different in the 70s and in the 80s. You have a much more uh, relaxed situation in Berlin. And uh, people learn to live with this very strange situation that half, half of the city is totally inside uh, the territory of the GDR. So whenever you want to go from West Germany to West Berlin, you have to pass the GDR. And uh, that, is all, that was often uh, a pain in the ass, if I may say so, because the control at the border was, uh, took hours and hours. And uh, so that's the reason why most people who traveled from Berlin and to Berlin decided to use uh, the plane. So you have uh, obviously no um, East German border control on the plane that started in West Berlin and landed in Munich or in Frankfurt or in Hanover. So I would say yes, in the early years, it was uh, more or less a part of the Berliners, uh, East as well as West. And uh, in the later years, in the 70s and 80s, I wouldn't say so. Besides the DDR Museum and the remnants of the Berlin Wall and the Brandenburg Gate, does the conflict, the Cold War, continue to shape any aspect of life in Berlin to this day? Or is the Cold War now confined to Berlin's history, like any other conflict from the 20th century, thinking primarily about World War I and World War II there? So Berlin and the Cold War, are there any legacies left? I mentioned there are a couple of areas could still go. Uh, we have uh, three permanent exhibitions dealing with GDR in town. And uh, I mentioned all the Stasi prisons and the former listening stations, the airport in Tempelhof and a lot of places you can still go. But keep in mind, it's now more than 30 years ago. The un German unification was in 1990. You can say it's a generation ago. And nowadays, the traces of the Cold War are still there, but you really have to look for them. They're not that obvious as they were in the 90s, of, of course, in the 70s, 80s. Uh, so Berlin is still very well known for being the capital of spies and being a hotspot in the Cold War. You can still go to Checkpoint Charlie, There's, there's a little hut and that reminds you of the tanks that stood there in 1961, the, the American tanks and the Soviet tanks that stood, stood there for more than a day. And that's the area when the Cold War could become pretty hot in Berlin. But for daily life, you know, no, that's gone. Uh, no more Cold War traces in, in daily life. You have to especially visit, visit those places and uh, you have to have an historical interest in that history. And, and then, as I said before, in Berlin, uh, that's the land of milk and honey. You will find a lot of things 
uh, if you really look for them and if, if you read your stuff before you come to the city, but for the daily life that plays no role. Well, thank goodness for that in uh, one sense. Okay, finally then, is there anything else that you wish to add before we conclude about your book, Capital of Spies or the Cold War, that the questions I've asked haven't given you the chance to address, Ben? Uh, looking at uh, the spies I'm dealing uh, with in my book, I came to the conclusion that these are very, yeah, strange um, individual uh, individuals who made basically on their own free will the decision to work for the other side. So the question what's in what's in the spy's mind uh, cannot be answered uh, in general. So you have to look at uh, all individual persons and see what was their motivation in some in some cases it was money obviously in some cases uh, money was paid and people were looking for money others were looking for 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 fame they want to, they just want to to get rid of their boring life and and others uh, couldn't cope with their life and then decided uh, to do something like this so uh, the individual decision to work uh, as a spy for the other side in the Cold War is a very interesting thing. And um, that's that's something, uh, looking back, uh, that uh, is still fascinating for me. Absolutely. Okay, then uh, let's conclude by, if you can, reminding us about your book and where we can get hold of that book. And perhaps if people have been listening to the podcast and want to ask you any questions, how they can get hold of you to ask those questions. So the book and you, where can we get hold of both of them? Well, as I said, the title is Capital of Spies. It's intelligence agencies in Berlin during the Cold War. And uh, it was done by me, Ben von Koska and Sven Felix Kellerhoff. And the publisher is uh, Casemate. And you can uh, buy it uh, on Amazon and uh, you can go to the bookshop around the corner and you can, uh, they order it for you within a day or two. And uh, whoever has a question for me, I uh, want to ask me something, uh, you can reach me uh, uh, via the Allied Museum. Uh, I'm on the Allied Museum's uh, page. Uh, I'm one of the curators there and there's my email address. And if you have a specific uh, question uh, concerning that period, uh, you're free uh, to contact me via uh, the Allied Museum and the email there. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Versus History Podcast. Visit us at www.versushistory.com and follow us at Versus History on Twitter and Instagram. You can download all episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or from wherever you get your podcasts.